Well, the first Sunday of Advent is focused on prophecy, uh, expectation, some people call it. They don't like the word prophecy. It sounds confusing to them. But they understand ex- expectation. You understand expectation. You understand the word prophecy. Um, Jesus, of course, he fulfilled many prophecies in his first Advent, uh, a, a plethora of them. You could not probably sit down in just a few minutes and write down the list of all the things that he fulfilled in that time. But you need to understand also that there, there remains a lot of prophecy that we see in Scripture that remains unfulfilled to this point, that Jesus has yet to fulfill, who, which he will fulfill. Now, last week we talked about Christ as King and what that means for our expectations, what that means for our expectations of our, you know, president, governor, government, what it means uh, for expectations for our church and the activities that we engage in as a church. Right? Those are important things. People get that line kind of blurry sometimes. It's important that we, we understand that. Uh, it's un- important that we understand what Scripture often calls the ages, right? The, the, the dispensations, the economias, the economies of time. Uh, you would call it dispensational, if you're dispensations, if you want to sound a little theological, that's a perfectly good word, but um, especially in a multilingual environment, dispensa means different things. <laughs> so, dispensationalism is the way that God divides up ages, and the way that he gives instructions to humanity in different ages or different periods of time. The, uh, in fact, it's, it's the recognition, right, that you understand that God himself does not change. Right? That's his immutability. That's part of his character. God does not himself change. His character does not change. And dispensationalism is a recognition that God himself does not change. But in different ages, he expresses his character differently. Now, the reason he does that, and this, is, this gets people confused, is not because he changes, it's because we do. <laughs> does that make sense? We, God doesn't change, but because we do, because the, the level of our knowledge, the level of our understanding, certain small spiritual things, you know, like being dwelt by the Holy Spirit, change us. And our capacity to understand and our capacity to, to act. Uh, we know more now than when people knew 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. And so God has different expectations, right? God couldn't hold people responsible for trusting in Jesus Christ before he was born. Are you glad about that? Because some people actually teach that. They do teach that, in fact, that Abraham, when it says that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness in Genesis 15, 6, that somehow they believed in Jesus thousands of years before Jesus was ever born doesn't say that, in fact. You can't hold people accountable for walking by the Spirit until the Spirit is indwelling a believer. We, we would all understand that. Um, we can't be reasonably and righteously required to exercise spiritual gifts that we don't have. Uh, Dr. Charles Riley is the guy who said that most recently, I think, that, uh, that every Christian is a dispensationalist whether they know it or not. Uh, it's a short version. Spirit Lewis Spirit Chaffer said something similar. It's a long version. Chaffer was kind of like that. You know, everything was the long version. It seemed like it's Lewis Spirit Chaffer. But he said, every Christian is a dispensationalist. The fact that we're here on Sunday, the fact that you didn't bring livestock with you, right? It means that you're a dispensationalist. You recognize that something changed between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Something changed uh, between before Christ First Advent and after his first Advent. We all realize that something is different. Um, but to say every Christian is a dispensationalist is a good way to take off a Reformed theologian pretty quickly. Maybe that's why he said it. Ryrie's no longer with us here on this earth, but he was good at that a little bit. We know many things, for instance, that that Adam and Eve didn't know. Uh, What people would call the age of innocence. Before the fall, Adam and Eve had two responsibilities. You know what those were? It was to 
keep the garden. One positive responsibility, one negative responsibility. Don't eat the fruit. Keep the garden. Don't eat the fruit. Real basic instructions. That's all they knew. That's all they had virtually. At least that we can see. We know more things than that. We know more about walking with God than keep the garden, don't eat the fruit. We all know that something changed since then. A friend of mine pointed out the fact that we're all wearing clothes could indicate that we're dispensationalists. What? Yes? No? You don't believe me? Go read Genesis again. The first few few chapters. Something changed and now we wear clothes. That was God's best at the time. Israel was given the law to progress things forward. Israel was given the law. The first the Ten Commandments, then, then the law. It was given in order that they would walk with God. It was no longer applicable to keep the garden and to not eat the fruit, right? So they were given Ten Commandments. They were given them the law. The law was given to them on the basis of what they knew, right? Paul says that it was a protector. It was a tutor. It was a guardian. It was to keep them safe, right? Because sin is what? bad for you. Yes? Sin is bad for you, so you need a hedge, a garden, I mean, excuse me, a guardian, garden, keep the garden with age of innocence, a guardian to protect you from the things that were bad for you. For people who are living this life without the benefit of the Spirit indwelling them, we, the church, Paul says, we are to walk by the Spirit in order to walk with God here and now. That's the other distinction that we ought to make in, when we talk about dispensations. The ge- dispensations generally deal with this life on this earth right now, in, our, in human history, right? That, that's the other key to understanding, that it does change. That God's instructions, the accountability structure changes to, to what we are accountable based on what we know, based on our capacity to understand things, that God's instructions about how to administer our lives in this world, how to live a life of blessing, of abundance, of peace and joy, how to walk with God, those things change. Now this should, this should kind of go without saying, but uh, preachers have to get good at saying things that should go without saying. So I'm working on that. Will you all be okay with that? Would you give walking instructions to somebody who's dead? Okay. Would you give walking instructions to someone who is dead? Everybody should have shaken their head vigorously. No, that would be stupid. That would be... I'm sorry, I said stupid. That would be unwise and undiscerning to give somebody who's dead walking instructions because what does a dead person need life the dispensations give walking instructions walking instructions you wouldn't tell a dead person how to live their lives the instructions for living one's life throughout all of human history the instructions for living one's life are different than the instructions for receiving life. For for the, the directions for living one's life to make any sense, you must possess a life to live, right? From the very beginning, we saw this, in fact, from Adam and Eve, in the age of innocence, in the garden, before the fall, before sin had entered humanity. They had instructions, didn't they? For living the life that they possessed. Living their lives. Even in their innocence. Even in their absolute, unspoiled, perfect position before God. Keep the garden. Don't eat the fruit. Instructions for living their lives. Now there are two ways that we... Well, there's probably more. There's more like a thousand ways, perhaps, that God's character is impugned these days. But as it relates to this this discussion particularly, right? The one we'll be most familiar with is, is uh, 
when people want to bring the law into the New Testament, right? Some kind of law. Some kind, usually they, they disregard the good and perfect law that is absolutely perfect when used lawfully, absolutely lawful when used lawfully, and they substitute their own, right? Don't drink, don't dance, don't smoke, don't, 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 don't. None of which is in actual, in the actual law, but they're, they bring in the law, right? Their own set of behavior standards, and they say this is, this is an ingredient of true faith. It's a component. Now, a few of them will say that works our faith. I have actually had somebody, several somebodies, tell me that works our faith, faith our works. They put an equated verb right there. I don't know what Bible they're reading, right? But they will say that the faith, normal is what they'll say, that normally the, the faith that gets us to heaven when we die must include behavior. And nobody bats an eyelash. Y'all didn't even bat an eyelash. If I say something like that, you need to drag me to the loony bin. It will take several of you. They'll say that in order for a faith to be valid or transforming or redemptive, that it has to have this behavior component. Lots of different ways of doing that. Lots of different approaches. Uh, I get surprised by anyone fairly frequently still. That should not only cause you a bad eyelash, it should make your eyes bug out. It should make the little vein in your forehead pop out like this. It should cause your heart rate to go up to a higher RPM. Steam out the ears would not be inappropriate. It should make you righteously indignant to use the word that people use to say that they think that Jesus never got angry. I got told that once. It should make you angry to hear God's character impugned that way. It's, it's spewed forth as garbage <laughs> and they're pretending to speak God's own words. It's, it's venom and vitriol. It impugns God's character. It impugns the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It treats Jesus' work as if it is imperfect, incomplete. It, it treats Jesus' person as if he is something less than perfectly loving, perfectly gracious, and perfectly capable. It treats God's favor as if his grace is something that still must be earned or validated. Needs to be a little earned. Of course, we know what about Christ's work. Stop me when I if I say something wrong. We know that it's complete. Yes? Finished. To tell us die. We know that it is perfect. We know that it is good. We know that it is loving. That it is free because of all those things. Did I say anything that makes your eyes bug out? Ears steam, vein pop. By grace alone, through Christ alone, through faith alone. <laughs> we wouldn't want to impugn God's character by treating this gift as if we have something to do with earning it. But there's another way, a pretty common way, that God's character is impugned frequently. It, it's, maybe it's less severe. Isn't severe kind of subjective? Maybe it's less severe. I don't think it's a lot less. And it's often by people who believe and teach that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, pretty clearly. If you were to ask them, in other words, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to go to heaven when I die? They will say, believe in Jesus. Are they right? Yes, they're right. Absolutely. They're right. Just like you or I would say. I hope that's what you say. Maybe people don't randomly just come up to you and say, hey, about my eternal destiny. <laughs> but if they do, that should be your unapologetic answer. If you want to go to heaven when you die, what must I do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. But often they're so intent on making that point that they feel the need to contrast it with something. 
to uh, make a sharp distinction. So if you change the question slightly, you might see the problem. Ask this question, not what must I do to be saved, but what, what did people back then have to do to be saved? What did people in the Old Testament have to do to be saved? I'm sorry, what? Follow the law, that's okay. They might have said that. A lot of people would say that. Believe, would it, yeah, okay. Okay, well, we obviously have a variety of answers here, even. Hmm. It's interesting. All of a sudden, it becomes the wild, wild west. It becomes kind of the judges period. You know what about the judges? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. When it comes to the Old Testament, most people just throw the cards up in the sea and say, I don't know, let's see what falls out. All the time. But some, most of the time, it's the most mild version. They had to believe God and keep the law. Does that make your ears steam and your eyes bug out and your vein pop out? I hope it will by the time we're done. What did people in the Old Testament have to do to be saved? All sorts of answers, but they had to keep the law as one of them. They had to keep the law and believe God as another. So in trying to defend, here's what it is. They're trying to defend grace for you and for me. They're trying to the utmost to demarcate exactly what it is that I have to do to receive God's grace. They throw God's character under the bus for all the rest of time. Because often the people that say they have to keep the law in the Old Testament, guess what? They'll say people alive during the tribulation have to keep the law. Those are people during the millennial kingdom also will have to keep the law. So it's just us, they'll say. Y'all don't believe me. That's good. I'm glad maybe you've never heard this. It's out there. It's all over. So in trying to defend grace for you and me, they throw God's character under the bus. They commingle the instructions for receiving life with living life. Remember, that's a bad thing. We don't need to commingle those instructions because God doesn't change. His character doesn't change. Everyone who ever received eternal life, who was ever justified before God, who was ever reconciled to Him, who was ever regenerated, if you were Billy Graham, you'd say, anybody who was ever saved. I'm not Billy Graham. I want to be a little more precise than that. But you understand, you go to heaven when we die. Everyone who is ever saved, everyone who ever went to heaven, understand this. Everyone who has ever gone to heaven when they died, who ever received everlasting, eternal life, went there by grace through faith. No exceptions. There are a lot of places we can go to show that. Old Testament is replete with it. There are hundreds, possibly thousands. We can go to the New Testament, Romans 3, 20, because, Paul says, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Right? Genesis 15, 6, we mentioned already, and Abraham believed God, and I like the word reckoned. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. It was imputed. It was credited to his account. A lot of times I like to go elsewhere. Why? Because everybody's already got their positions settled on the common passages. Yeah? You've experienced this, right? They, they go here, they go there and prove their point. It's almost scripted, you know? It's like, uh, have, you ever, have you ever gone to one of those dinner theater things where they have the knights actually jousting in front of you while you eat your meal? Come on. Let's pull some people from the dinner table and let them joust. Then it would be exciting, right? Because it's not so scripted. We don't know blow by blow what's going to happen. I can script a conversation for you between two people over James 2, 14 to 26. Over Romans... 323, over John 3.16, over these verses. I, I can almost tell you word for word what's going to be said, probably in more than one language. So I like to go other places sometimes because it's not ironclad. It's not armor clad. We're still a little flexible, right? A little flexible, all right? 
So it says here, and it helps to plow new ground. It says here in Psalm 80. This is one I found. I like it. You're in Psalm 80? I don't know if it's going to be on the screen. It tells you where I am up there. Every once in a while, somebody tricks me and puts the text up there, and I don't know it. Benefits of being a dinosaur. It says, Let your hand be upon the man of your right hand, upon the son of man whom you made strong for yourself. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us, and we will call upon your name, O Lord God of hosts. Restore us. Cause your face to shine on us, and we will be saved. This isn't, a, this isn't a psalm of David. Most of them are. It's a psalm of Asaph. You know who Asaph was? Asaph was the, the choir director for the whole nation. He, he was an amazing guy. And I'm sure that he wore a black shirt, just like Jacob. Jacob's an amazing guy, too. But he objected to me calling him the man in black today. So I'm not sure. We may have a a fault in our relationship. I'm not sure. It was a compliment. Asaph was a choir director for the whole nation. If you look at the head, this is a psalm of Asaph. He's a godly man, a wise man. And in this psalm, he is lamenting the, the state of the nation. He's observing it, right? And, and he's looking at this time frame during the period of David. He's looking at the problems that are, that are existing in his nation. Can you empathize? Yes, the problems that exist. It doesn't matter who the elected officials are. It doesn't matter. There's always problems to see, to observe, to address. But specifically, he sees Israel suffering under the oppression of her enemies. And three times in the psalm, he says something similar. He says, O oh God of hosts, restore us and cause your face to shine. And we will be saved. Cause your face to shine and we will be saved. Expressing his knowledge, even way back there in the Old Testament, back in David's reign. Expressing that in the midst of any circumstance, God is the only one who is able to save them. But it's here in verses 17 to 19 that he tells us how. He expects that, and in whom he expects God to work to save them. Because may it come to pass, uh, may it come to pass, lead is kind of a way to keep the, the poetry intact. It's a wish. He's wishing this. May it come to pass that your hand is upon the man of your right hand. This last week, my two little, my little kids aren't in here. I can use them for an illustration, right? We decided we got a big chunk of firewood out in the yard. We got a lathe here, and we got a little know-how, right? So we're going to take the lathe. We're going to make some Christmas ornaments. You know, some of y'all saw the pictures of this thing. Well, Isaac, up here, he's ten feet tall and bulletproof. He's made of steel. He doesn't need any help with anything. The man asked for concrete, rebar, and bulletproof glass for his birthday. He's seven. my boy. But listen, he's still little. His fingers are still little. His forearms aren't that big around. So we stick this piece of fire on the lathe and I have chosen this man I have this young boy and I have chosen this piece of wood and I have chosen the tool that we're going to use. Stand him up on a box and I put his hands on the chisel both ends like this, two-handed and my hands completely encircle his. He's doing it. He doesn't need me. Back and forth. To form what it is that we have planned it to be. Put your hand on his hand. Put your hand upon him. On the one that you've chosen to do this. Give him your power. Your guidance. Your strength. Your knowledge. Your discernment. Your wisdom. And impute it right here. Impart it to this man. In this psalm, Asaph has referred to Israel as as son. Here he says, the man of your right hand. He's changed the terminology from son to man. This is the word ish of his right hand, a man, right? 
he would say, this is, this is his right hand man. This is the guy he trusts. This is the guy he's chosen. This is the guy he's selected. Meaning, he is the one that is critical to this outcome that God desires. It is someone to whom is delegated adequate authority to accomplish that purpose. He has sufficient power, oversight. A male human is what an ish is. Sometimes call my wife Isha. Right? Ish, Isha. It's wonderful poetry in the Hebrew language. Ish and Isha go together. Then he says the son of man. A little bit different here. Literally, it would be the son of Adam. Adam is kind of a plain vanilla word. Did you know that? The word in, in Hebrew for dirt? Soil? Maybe even compost? I don't know. Adama. Adam. Kind of means thing that sprung from the dirt. <laughs> but we know it's a personal name. Son of Adam. The son being the one who inherited the right to Adam's dominion. Adam's position. Not, not a nation, not to a people, but to a man, a singular individual. A man that God has established. And Asaph says, this is a man you have made strong for yourself, for your own purposes. And according to it, he has strengthened this man and placed him in this position for this purpose. Remember, this is a wish. This is how Asaph expected. Now, this is Expectation Sunday, Prophecy Sunday. This is what Asaph expected in the fulfillment of prophecy to his people. He recognized that this is the way that this was going to work. He recognized that there was going to be a man who was lifted up, who was strengthened, a son of Adam, who would be given God's strength, whose God's hand would be upon in order to save them. That's what he expected. He recognized God's promise. He recognized God's grace. And he recognized through whom it was supposed to come. Now you can read that whole psalm. You know what you won't find? A bilateral contractual agreement. You know what that means? No tit for tat. No quid pro quo. No I'll scratch your back God if you scratch ours. Not there. No exchange. We see in sitcoms and movies all the time, right? I, I promised God I would never touch this substance ever again if he just pulled me out of this, right? And I had somebody tell me that actually recently. Whitewater rafting trip. Got stuck at the end of a, of a drop. And he called out to God, which Romans 10, 10 tells us is the only thing that is necessary. <laughs> but he made God a promise. I will live for you if you pull me out of this water. I'm not sure if that's a great reason to live for God, but that's what he promised. That's not what Asaph does here. God exercises his grace. The psalmist speaks for all of the people as the, the national director of the choir, worship team, singing group, whatever we call it, right now. And he says, if you do this, we will, we will not diverge from you. It's not a behavior. We will not cease to look on your face. We will call upon your name. Revive us. Let us live. We will look only to you. We will rely only on you. We will have faith only in you and your grace. There is no contract for Remediate, remediated behavior. If you do this, we'll do that. Now, understand Asaph is probably looking at what he expected of his king, David, a man after God's own heart. King David. Throughout Scripture, David is described as a, a type of Christ, a foreshadowing 
of who he is, to give us an indication of, of, of who the Messiah would be and how he would save his people, how he would behave. The recognition is the same, though. Asaph expected salvation to come through one man that God chose by his grace, the source of salvation. So let's be careful. We're, we're real careful here at El Paso Bible Church about bringing law into the New Testament, right? It's also very important that we understand what law did in the Old Testament. Yes? What law did and didn't do. The law never got anybody to heaven. Nobody ever behaved themselves unto righteousness. Nobody. And it was never given for that purpose. Now I won't argue that some people were deceived, as some people are deceived today, that the law has some part in the gospel. That behavior has anything to do with true saving faith. Who is deceived by it is no issue. God never declared it to be so. He never gave the law a part in declaring anybody righteous. Not once. So let's be careful. Okay? That we don't follow. Let's believe in Jesus. You need to believe in Jesus with we're not like Israel. We don't have to keep the law to go to heaven when we die. I hear that so often. That they had to keep the law, that they had to sacrifice animals in order to go to heaven when they die. That, Hebrews tells us that could never work. It never had one second of hope to do that. God's grace is God's grace in every age. So we need to resist the temptation uh, to elevate our special status as the church. And we do have a special status. We're, we are unique in all of the ages. In all of the dispensations, in all of the times that God has given instructions for living our lives, for walking with God, we are unique, but let's make sure that when we're recognizing that, we're not besmirching God's character, even unintentionally. We should lift him up and praise his name for his grace in every age, at every time. Yes? Yes?